I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So I love Christmas romantic comedies. I confess that they are a guilty pleasure of mine. Um, and one of my favorite franchises is the Princess Switch franchise on Netflix. I absolutely love the first two movies. Vanessa Hudgens is just having a fantastic time playing multiple versions of herself and hijinks ensue. But I was gravely disappointed in the third installment of the franchise that came out this year, The Princess Switch 3, uh, which, and amongst other things, involved a story of an estranged parent suddenly showing up again uh, to their deeply hurt and traumatized child and just being like, I love you. And their relationship is magically healed by the power of love and Christmas. And the people who were watching this movie with me can attest that I was just shouting at the television at this point. Uh, and this is one of my least favorite tropes for lack of a better term in these Christmas holiday extravaganzas that they often have at their heart some very sappy and saccharine tale of redemption and reconciliation. Again, healed through the magic of Christmas, but absent the hard work of real reconciliation and reckoning with harm done. And one might say that I am making too much of these delightful holiday romps. Perhaps I am. But I think part of what I find troubling in this trend and in this kind of sappy, saccharine notion of reconciliation that media <laughs> packages and markets to us at this time of year is precisely because it, it undervalues the true and hard work of reconciliation and repentance that we are called into, particularly in this Advent season leading up to Christmas. And in so doing, it underplays the true, real, and profound hope of redemption that is being offered to us. The quintessential figure for this in the Advent season is John the Baptist, who appears to us every year on this second Sunday of Advent. The voice in the wilderness crying out about the baptism for the repentance and forgiveness of sins, proclaiming that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And this year, we get the story of John the Baptist told through us, told to us through the Gospel of Luke. And what I find fascinating is if we, you know, kind of think about John the Baptist, you know, we have that image of wearing camel skin and eating locusts and wild honey and all of these great eccentricities about John's person. But Luke puts a lot less emphasis on that. We don't actually get much of a description of John the Baptist at all. What we get much more than his person is his position. And Luke begins very intentionally with a, an, an establishing line that, that you know, we are set up in the historical moment with references to who the emperor is and when this is taking place and what's happening in the seat of power. That's the opening sort of place setting for this moment. And then in contrast to that seat of power and authority, we have John in the wilderness. And it's important for us to remember that in the great tradition of scripture, the wilderness is the place of encountering God. This is where God finds us. And I think Luke makes that all the more intentional by setting the wilderness, setting the place of God's activity so clearly in juxtaposition with the reality of earthly power and authority and what seems like the scene of great importance. And in the words of John, 
calling us to prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight, evoking those words from the prophet Isaiah. We see that call to put aside, to lay bare and level everything that we are taught and conditioned in our human agency to think of as the seat of power and importance and privilege and authority. And at the heart of this is that simple word of John, a calling to a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. And there are the there are those that would see in John's language and in the person of John, perhaps that ominous somber tone that is sometimes reflected in the season of Advent, that claim to, you know, recapture Advent as a penitential season, much more in keeping with the vibe of Lent leading up to Easter, for example. But I wonder if perhaps we are mistaken in that. And it is our own conditioning that makes us uncomfortable with repentance that allows us to lose sight of the hope and the truth of John's message, that it is precisely the act of repenting, of turning away from everything that we have been conditioned to think of as the false sources of our well-being and power and status and turning to the truth of God's coming presence breaking into our world that is itself the good news. And the truth is, we as Christians engage in that work of repentance precisely in hope in the hope of God setting right all that is wrong, all that is wrong within us and all that is so desperately wrong in the world around us. And the truth is we don't have to settle for saccharine, unsatisfying stories of reconciliation that we know deep in ourselves are actually lies sold to us in the plastic consumeristic trappings of our holiday season, but we have a deeper truth into which we are being called to live. The real work of redemption, repentance undertaken in the hope of God's true reconciling love. And we see this played out in the world right now. And in some ways, I hate to talk about this because it feels like a conversation that's just so overplayed in the world right now for the sake of scoring political points. And yet, I think there is a real truth to it. In this debate, we see raging on social media and in the news about critical race theory being taught in schools, one faction wanting us to look with truth and honesty at the history of our country and our institutions. I dare say we could say the history of our church and, and another group wanting to cover this up, not wanting to look at the mess of our systemic injustice that has been a part of our common life since the beginning of our nation, wanting us to move ahead in an easy but false peace. And I think the church has a word and a hope to speak into this moment, a call and a reminder that the more seriously we take our faith and our identity as followers of Christ, as the church, the more fully we should be empowered and encouraged to look with honesty at our failings, at our sins both in ourselves and collectively, and to do so in the hope that we are being called to real redemption and reconciliation. Work of repentance is not just something passive, but it is 
a truth and a reality that we live into actively with hope. That is the message of this Advent season. That is unsettling, that is disruptive, and yet it is ultimately the truest, realest hope we have of all that is wrong in this world, actually, not just being papered over with saccharine sentimentality, but with real healing. I want to conclude by noting the Advent series that we're doing at Harcourt Parish, which is the series of these videos, members of our congregation, reflecting on pieces of music in this season that speak to them. And this week, you'll be seeing from our Harcourt member and Kenyan professor John Taswell, his reflections on the spiritual Lord, what a morning, and Handel's Messiah, the resonance particularly of the image of the great trumpet clash into our world that speaks to the breaking in of God's presence, which is hope of redemption, hope of salvation, but it is a winnowing fire. It is salvation that comes with great disruption. The question we are asked, are we open? to that disruption? Are we open to the work of real repentance and the work of reparation and restoration? Or do we want the saccharine false sentimentality of a holiday movie that is as false as it is unsatisfying? Let us embrace the good news of repentance and restoration. Amen.